in three, two. Good afternoon. My name is Rod McMillian. I now call to order the May 23rd, 2023 meeting of the Audit Committee of the Board of Education, Baltimore County. In accordance with Board Policy 8311, the chair of a committee at the discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's audit committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to conduct this meeting efficiently, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will set their names before making and seconding the motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. As a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Jamison or Ms. Barr now lost track. If you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Jamison, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I will start with Ms. Lichter. Yes, present. Ms. Frempong. Present. Mr. Young. Mr. McMillian. Present. Thank you. A quorum, thank you. A quorum being present, will we begin? Ms. Jamison, please call the roll of staff members participating in today's meeting. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I will start with Ms. Barr. Present. Ms. Stevens. Present. Ms. Manna. Present. Mr. Fletcher. Present. Mr. Strait. Ms. Sample. Here. Ms. Crew. Present. Mr. Edwards. Present. Ms. Smith. Mr. Hartlove. Present. Dr. Boswell McComas. Dr. Ferguson. Present. Dr. Roberts. Present. Thank you. Are there any other attendees present that I did not recognize? Hearing no additional names. Oh, it looks ahead. like Mr. Mr. Young joined. Oh, Mr. Young. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I will reflect Great. his presence. Hearing no additional names, I turn the meeting back to you, Mr. McMillian. Thanks, Ms. Jamison. Good afternoon. If committee members have questions that are outside the scope of the reports presented this afternoon, please email Ms. Barr or myself with your questions. We will follow up with appropriate individuals to get the answers to your questions. Item three, approval of minutes. The live video footage of our last meeting represents the minutes of the meeting. The meeting stand approved as recorded. Item number four, reports. Ms. Crew and Ms. Stevens, please proceed with FY23 student enrollment audit results. Hello, it's Lauren Crew. Um, Mr. Corns, can you please bring up the student enrollment process and data accuracy report? Thank you. Can you start on the highlights page? Right there, thank you. Okay, we completed the student enrollment process and data accuracy audit and issued the final report on May 19th, 2023. The report can be found on board docs for this meeting and it is posted on internal audits website. Staff in the Department of Social Emotional Support and the Office of School Climate and Culture work collaboratively with schools to support students and their families with enrollment in BCPS. Enrollment liaisons, the administrative and record secretaries at the school are responsible for entering data into focus during the enrollment process. The objective of the audit was to determine if students are properly enrolled in BCPS and related data is accurate within the school information system. The period reviewed for the audit was fiscal year 2022 and fiscal year 2023. Mr. Corns, can you please move to page two? Thank you. Before we get to the issues, we would like to talk about two accommodations we noted in the report. The first accommodation is related to communication. The executive director of social emotional support and the director of school climate and culture were prompt in their submission of audit requests and provided detailed explanations when follow up was requested. The second accommodation is related to annual student enrollment training provided by the Department of Social Emotional Support and the Office of School Climate and Culture. 
Our review of the training materials indicated that it provided useful information for the enrollment and residency process. Mr. Corn, can you please move to page three? Next, Ms. Deborah Stevens and I will discuss the eight issues we identified. And for each recommendation, Ms. Uh, Dr. Kimberly Ferguson, Executive Director of Social Emotional Support, will discuss the corrective actions. The first issue is system wide training is not provided for newly hired enrollment liaisons. Our recommendation is that the Executive Director should work with the Department of Employee Training and Development to develop and implement online enrollment training for newly hired enrollment liaisons and work with the Division of Human Resources to ensure that newly hired enrollment liaisons are trained. I will turn it over to Dr. Kimberly Ferguson to discuss the corrective action for this recommendation. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Lauren said, um, our plan is to actually get a list of newly hired enrollment secretaries um, from HR. That's not something we have typically gotten in the past. Um, and to provide those members, those new um, staff members with a year long training program. Um, and that will be in addition to what we already do. Um, as mentioned in one of the commendations, we do provide regular training to our current enrollment liaisons. We're just unaware of when enrollment liaisons are hired. So um, we will collaborate with the Office of Human Resources to um, to identify who those staff persons are and to make sure they receive um, some training that is relevant to their job, including training on how to use our student information system. And we've been working with um, members of DOIT to develop that, that training um, over this past year. We also are in the process of creating a procedural manual that will be uploaded to our uh, record secretary or enrollment secretary Schoology group uh, for them to access at any point uh, in the school year. Thank you, Dr. Ferguson. Uh, Mr. Corns, can you please move it to page five? The second issue is the presentation of student enrollment information on the BCPS website is not concise or user friendly. Specifically, the BCPS website does not provide clear guidance to the community regarding the student enrollment process. A parent or guardian must access multiple links within the BCPS website for enrollment information, and some links do not take the user to the correct or most useful page. Mr. Corn, can you please move to page six? Thank you. Our recommendation is that the social emotional staff should work with other relevant offices to provide parents or guardians with all necessary enrollment information related to online and in person registration that can be accessed from one main student enrollment page. Include links to special services such as ESOL, homeschooling, shared domicile arrangements, and magnet programs. I will again turn it over to Dr. Kimberly Ferguson to discuss the corrective actions for this recommendation. Thank you, Lauren. Um, I, this has been, um, this particular issue has been a kind of a thorn in my side. So I am thankful that this was highlighted by the audit committee. Um, we have actually met with the Office of Communications twice this month since we received the initial recommendations um, to work on uh, the system's web website so that parents are able to get really clear information. We provided them with a mock-up of what we think it should look like, and we have another meeting scheduled for June um, to actually look at the final mock-up of when parents go in to access, you know, enroll your child, they go to one page, one location, and they get the necessary information that they need. And they're also directed to other sites where additional information might be located. For example, if they're interested in magnet programs, if they're interested in early childhood, 
or any type of special permission transfers, they go direct, they'll get links to those pages. So we're excited that this work is already started. Um, so that is the that's the corrective action is to, to get it to get that website updated and to get those links really clear and user friendly for our families. Thank you, Dr. Ferguson. Mr. Corns, can you please move to page seven? Thank you. Okay, the third issue is the required documentation for newly enrolled students was not available to verify Baltimore County residency in accordance with Superintendent Rule 5150. Specifically for 37 of the 16 newly enrolled students, appropriate documentation was not available from the school to verify Baltimore County residency. Mr. Corns, can you move to page eight, please? Okay. Our recommendation to ensure the appropriate documentation is obtained at the schools when verifying Baltimore County residency is to routinely communicate Superintendent Rule 5150 to school principals and enrollment liaisons. Revise Superintendent Rule 5150 if the printout from the Maryland Department of Assessments and Taxation database is an acceptable documentation and continue to conduct records reviews at the schools and provide timely feedback. I will turn it over to Dr. Kimberly Ferguson to discuss the corrective actions for this recommendation. Thank you, Lauren. Um, so again, we will be, um, we actually have superintendent's rule 5150 on the schedule to be revised uh, in the fall of this coming year. Um, that is something that we've been wanting to do once again for quite some time. Um, we discovered during our time in uh, during the time we were out of school during COVID, that we had to be a bit more flexible in some of the documents that families provided. Um, and we found that uh, the provision of that taxation document was appropriate, but it's not listed in our in our rule. So we uh, we do have that scheduled to be revised in the fall and we'll be taking that through the uh, PRC committee. Um, we also will be once again going through the training with our enrollment liaisons and ensuring that we get those who are the ones that are not providing the most appropriate um, documentation. We're going to get them back into training and make sure that they understand what they're supposed to um, what they're supposed to collect from families. Uh, so we'll we'll be involving them in the year long induction. And then also we'll continue our student record reviews. Um, those started about maybe uh, pre-COVID and then picked back up once we were back in school um, where we go out to schools and audit uh, five to 10 percent of the school's record, like randomly select student records and go out and do a physical audit of those records to ensure that they have the documents required by our rule by 5150. So we'll continue those student record reviews uh, moving into next school year as well. Thank you, Dr. Ferguson. Mr. Corns, can you move, please move to page nine? Perfect, thank you. The fourth issue is shared domicile disclosure forms and renewals are not completed and approved in accordance with rule Student, Superintendent Rule 5150. Specifically, documentation was not available or acceptable to verify the students were eligible for enrollment in BCPS due to a shared domicile arrangement with a homeowner in Baltimore County. Mr. Corns, can you please move to page 10? Thank you. Our recommendation to ensure that shared domicile applications and renewals are processed according to Rule 5150 is routine, routinely communicating Superintendent Rule 5150, identify students who are approved as a shared domicile placement and ensure that the shared domicile disclosure or renewal has been received and approved, Work with the chief of schools to ensure that principals are monitoring students identified as shared domicile placements. Revise superintendent rule 5150 if it is acceptable, acceptable to delay withdrawal of students whose renewal have not been completed and continue to conduct records reviews at the schools to provide timely and provide timely feedback. I will again turn it over to Dr. Kimberly Ferguson to discuss the corrective actions for this recommendation. 
Yes, thank you, Lauren. So again, um, when this is another um, issue related to training, um, not only for our people personnel workers, but also for our school-based staff. Um, as I said before, during the time when we were out of the buildings, um, we did make several adjustments to our timelines for families, as well as some of the documentation that we collected from them to keep kids enrolled in school. Um, since then, we've been trying to go back to the practices that are established in our policies and rules. And as a result, some of the folders don't have the documents that they're supposed to have. Um, but we're tightening all of that up and we'll uh, go through the process of reviewing folders, reviewing shared domiciles, initial shared domiciles that are um, that are approved by the PPWs, but then those shared domicile renewals really supporting our principals in making sure that they get those documents in a timely manner. Um, as you know, our our policy says that we'll we'll um, we'll remove the kid from the role by June 30th if they don't have the shared domicile renewal. And certainly um, during the pandemic, we did not want to remove any kid from the role, um, but we are back to some of those practices. Uh, we just have to really tighten up on our communication to families to get them to submit those documents in a timely manner so the kids can remain in our system. Um, and once again, just as I said in the last related to the last recommendation, we do have um, policy and rule 5150 slated to go uh, through the process, uh, PRC process uh, in the fall of 2023. So we'll be making some revisions um, to the required documents, as well as we'll be discussing whether or not we want to adjust the timelines. That That is a committee decision um, and certainly will fall on the board for approval, um, but we'll address that in the fall. Thank you, Dr. Ferguson. Mr. Corns, can you please move to page 12? Um, at this time, I'll pass it over to Ms. Deborah Stevens to discuss the next four issues. Thanks, Lauren, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so the next three issues pertain to students who are approved um, for special permission transfers and to students who are special enrollment placements. So there seems to be some confusion sometimes with those two terms. So I'd just like to take a minute to explain the difference between these circumstances before I get into the, uh, into the issues. So a special permission transfer is a request by a parent or a guardian for their student to attend a school outside of their attendance area. Uh, there are two different processes involved with that, uh, depending on the reason for the request. So a Form A transfer um, is requested by a parent, and it can be for various reasons, including um, residence changes, programs of study, it's, if it's a child of an employee, child care issues, boundary changes, that sort of thing. Um, and Form A transfers are approved by the principal of the receiving school. So the second type of special permission transfer is a Form B transfer, and that may be requested by a parent um, for a child that has medical or um, emotional or social adjustment um, reasons. Uh, detailed documentation is required um, from the student's medical or mental health provider and must be uh, provided um, with the request. Um, so Form B is actually submitted to the director of school climate, not to the school principal. Um, for approval or denial. So in contrast to special permission transfers, now we're going to talk about the special enrollment placements. Um, these are uh, students that are being enrolled due to homelessness, kinship or hardship case, or maybe at the request um, of a state agency such as Department of Social Services. Uh, the review and approval process for these students are the responsibility of a BCPS pupil personnel worker. So keeping those things in mind, I'll get back to the issues. So I'd like to discuss issue five, which we're already on page 12. And we found that the data in the FOCUS student information system is not accurate or sufficient to identify who the special permission transfer students are that are attending school outside of their home school. Uh, this was primarily due to errors in the use of a field in FOCUS called the address override field. Um, and that would have been, um, errors made by the enrollment liaisons at the schools. So this field is used to identify various reasons for special permission transfers, some of the ones that I just discussed, um, as well as other enrollment situations. 
So if you could move to page 14. Our recommendations include uh, continuing to communicate the expected use of the address override reason field and focus to our school principals and enrollment liaisons, identifying and monitoring the students with an override reason that's associated with a special permission transfer, evaluating the existing options that are included in the drop down menu for the address override and considering adding additional fields or drop down options um, to clearly identify students that are approved for special permission transfers via the form A or form B. So I will turn it over to Dr. Ferguson for her management's plan corrective action. OK, thank you. I am going to turn it over to Dr. Roberts um, because he is the expert when it comes to all things focus. So I'm going to let him respond to what our corrective actions are for um, this particular issue. Dr. Roberts. Good afternoon, everyone. In light of the finding in this particular area, we have already assembled a committee of pupil personnel workers to better provide an explanation, if you will, for the use of the address override feature. And we want the drop down menu that our enrollment liaisons select from to clearly indicate the reason for the override. Uh, for example, if a student is being approved for special permission transfer, we want all of the options that are associated with that form A to begin with SPT-A and then it would say something like child of employee or SPTA program of study or SPTA a child of employee. And so we want it to be very clear so that there's no misuse of that. Same thing if it's a special permission transfer form B. We want all of the reasons associated with that form B application to be clearly delineated. So they would begin with SP T dash B and it would say social emotional adjustment or SPT dash B health reasons. And so we are working to revise that drop down option so that our enrollment colleagues at the school will be very clear on which address override to use. And once we clear that up, we'll be able to run any kind of report to readily identify students throughout the school system who are in a school based on the address override feature. All right, great, thank you very much. So we're gonna move on to issue six, so that'll be page 16. Um, so we're still focused here on the special permission transfers, um, but these will be specifically for those students that are requesting uh, medical or student adjustment reasons. Uh, which are the Form B transfers. Uh, we found that these transfers were not completed and approved in accordance with Superintendent Rule 5140. Um, instead, a Form A was used instead of a Form B, um, and the Form A was uh, approved by the school principal for student circumstances that should have been uh, sent to the Director of School Climate. Uh, school principals are not authorized to approve these types of transfers. They really need to go to the Director of School Climate. So. Our recommendations include routinely communicating the requirement of Superintendent Rule 5140 to our school principals and enrollment liaisons, and to identify and monitor students with that address override reason for medical reason or behavioral adjustment, and ensure that a Form B has been received and approved by the appropriate individuals. Um, if we did identify someone who had um, you know, used a Form A um, erroneously, we would be able to uh, correct that. So once again, I turn the discussion back to Dr. Ferguson. OK, and Dr. Roberts is ready. <laughs> He's ready to jump right in. Dr. Roberts. <laughs> yes, as I said a few minutes ago, once we are able to reconfigure that drop down choice menu and principals are approving even those form A's, we will be able to run a report in the Office of School Climate to see who the principal has approved for a special permission, and then we can make sure that the paperwork coincides with that. So once we are armed with a report that says the principal approved these students for an A, then as part of our records review at the school, we can make sure that there is an accompanying application that coincides with that. And at that time, if a principal has accepted 
a special permission transfer on a form that's incorrect, we'll be able to see that and make that correction. Perfect, thank you. Uh, so we are going to uh, move on to issue eight. Oh, I'm sorry, issue seven. So these are the uh, special enrollment placements. So these are the ones that are done by the PPWs. Um, these are for the homeless students, hardship cases, agency placed, et cetera. So we found that the data in focus is not accurate to identify the special enrollment placement students. Uh, this occurred for two different reasons. Uh, data fields for students who were previously enrolled as special enrollment placements uh, were not updated once the student was no longer a special enrollment. So uh, say we have a homeless student that was enrolled last year as homeless. Um, this year they're in more stable um, living conditions, so they're not uh, considered to be homeless anymore, but that information was never updated in focus. Um, Additionally, enrollment liaisons are confusing uh, special permission transfers and shared domicile situations and um, designating those as special enrollment placements in focus. So that's uh, a training issue there. Uh, so our recommendations include routinely, routinely communicating Superintendent Rule 5150 to our PPWs, school principals, and our enrollment liaisons, and to identify students with a special enrollment placement designation in focus and monitor to ensure that the appropriate documentation has been received and approved by the appropriate individual. So Dr. Ferguson. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Roberts. <laughs> Once again, he's our focus person. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to say that we have worked very closely with members of Mr. Korn's team, Jocelyn Lear and Tony Weber in particular, to uh, configure focus in a way that we are able now to identify those students who are enrolled in our schools under a special circumstance. When focus first came along, we did not have that feature, but as we have discovered some of these issues ourselves, we've gone back and forth to the focus team to say, hey, we need to have this, we need to have this. And the focus team, the BCPS focus team has been very responsive to our needs. And I'm happy to say that we are now able to run a system-wide report to identify those students who are enrolled under a special circumstance. And one of the features that was just rolled out earlier this month is our enrollment liaisons at the school level have on their focus homepage a portal alert that lets them know how many shared domicile students they have in the school. And once they click on that alert, they are able to see a list of those specific students. And they can, as they receive updated documentation for those shared domicile students and they resolve that issue, that portal alert number will decrease. And so we've asked that that portal alert remain available on the enrollment liaisons portal page through October. And so every day when our secretaries go in, they can see a real time listing of those shared domicile students and know that how many are outstanding so that they can continue to work through them along with their PPW and other support staff. Very good, thank you. <clears throat> uh, so we'll be moving to issue eight on page 20. This issue relates to requests received by the help desk um, over about an approximate one year period that are related to the enrollment process. Uh, these requests are forwarded from the BCPS help desk to the Department of Social Emotional Supports for resolution. Um, we did find out that the uh, requests were not being resolved timely, and you can see the statistics there on the screen. Uh, so we recommend for this uh, that the executive director should ensure that the requests for assistance are addressed timely and that enrollment liaisons are fully supported and work with the Department of Information Technology to address misrouted tickets and uh, the closing of tickets. So I will again turn it over to Dr. Ferguson. Uh, so I'll take this one. So um, as the recommendations say, we will work, work really hard to address those VCPS serve tickets. Um, a number of the tickets are misrouted. Um, we're getting requests to solve issues that were not capable of solving uh, very technical issues. Um, we serve on the programmatic side. So if you, 
need to know how to enroll a kid or if there's some information that you need about enrollment, we're able to respond to those. But most most of our help desk tickets are just that, like tech tech support. Um, and we we just don't we we just don't know how to solve them. <laughs> we're we're not tech support people. So um, we've been working with, um, we've already met with Jody and her team, Jody Obenstein and her team to talk about um, how some of those tickets have been um, routed incorrectly. Um, and certainly she's gonna take that informa information back to her team so that we get the tickets that we, um, that we can solve. Um, and in a number of cases, what Dr. Roberts and I do, instead of, going back and closing out tickets, we call the school directly and solve the problem over the phone because it requires us to share the screen. Um, so we're we're solving them in real time over the phone, but just not closing them out in the BCPS serve portal. Um, but we'll we'll do better. We'll do better. We'll we'll figure out how to how to make that happen moving forward. Great. Thank you. So that's it for the identified issues, but I'd like to emphasize an observation that we made during this audit. Um, as noted in some of our audits, the responsibilities for, um, you can just stay there for right now, Jim. Um, the responsibilities for proper student enrollment are shared between central office staff and the school-based staff. Um, therefore, we feel that an in-depth review of the shared responsibilities uh, should be conducted to determine which part of the organization should be responsible for general enrollment, sh shared domicile, special permission transfers, and special enrollments. So, um, so now, Jim, if you could move to page 22 for the last item, uh, which is the audit rating. Um, so due to the non-compliance with the superintendent rules, um, some lack of documentation and the number of serious issues that we noted, uh, this audit did receive an unsatisfactory rating. Um, it's our opinion that urgent corrective action is needed and necessary to ensure that enrollment data is complete and correct. Um, the good news is that from our discussions today, um, we can see that Dr. Ferguson and her staff have already begun implementing those actions. Um, but our office internal audit will continue to monitor the completion of the corrective action uh, to ensure that the risks are mitigated. Um, and once again, we want to thank uh, Dr. Ferguson and Dr. Roberts and all of their staff for their full support and cooperation during this audit. It was very much appreciated. And additional thanks go to uh, Mr. Corns and Ms. Lear for their support as well from the IT side of the house. So that's it for the presentation. If there's any questions, we can take those at this time. Thank you very much. Committee members, any discussion on this topic? Ms. Lichter. I just have um, a question. So first, thank you for the report. It was extremely comprehensive and, and thank you, um, Dr. Ferguson, for your work on already putting together a comprehensive you know, correction, corrective action plan. When when um, audits come like this to the board and are found with um, findings, do we ever get like follow up? Will there be anything that circles back around to talk about how we're doing with the different issues that were uncovered? Yes, we will. We will continue to follow up until um, the all of the issues are resolved, um, and we're still working on the format of how we will um, present that in report form. Um, but yes, you will be uh, updated. Okay, thank you. Any additional questions? Okay, I would Hi, like to excuse me. Yes, yes, please. This is board member Frimpong. I have quite a few questions, so if you had some first, you can go ahead. No, I, I don't. Oh, OK, um, so let me go back to my notes. Um, within the audit, it said that there the audit for the 60 newly enrolled students, um, there were issues found there. My question was, what schools or areas? And I asked from the perspective of, was there a particular area that had higher instances of issues or was it kind of spread throughout BCPS? So, Lauren, I believe you did a little bit of work on that. Was it 80 some schools that we we um, audited but, in, in total? We audited over 80 schools. Um, for um, newly registered, I'd have to look exactly how many of the uh, um, 60 were from different schools, but we hit a large range of them. There were not a lot of overlaps. So we were looking at the 60 schools, we probably, or 60 uh, test items, we probably were looking at close to 50 schools. Um, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head right now, but we did look, it was a large variety. It wasn't 
all focused on one area, one school. OK, great, thank you. Um, the next question, so Dr. Ferguson spoke to this a little bit already since the policy will be coming up for PRC. Um, I understand the September 30th date is an MSDE requirement. Um, I guess, will they also discuss that June 30th date for the shared domicile renewal form? Is that something that's required or is that arbitrarily determined by BCPS? And will that be discussed, I guess, as well in PRC? So um, when we discussed the um, revising the policy, that June 30th date is something that BCPS um, has has decided quite some time ago. So we have flexibility with that date. Um, it is not something that's demanded by um, MSDE. Uh, that'll be a point of discussion when we pull the committee together to discuss revising the um, policy and rule. Okay, great. Um, next question was about the, there was a mention for issue eight about it was 30 days open as far as 83 incidents. Is there some goal or metric that all tickets should be closed within 30 days? I guess that's more of the, the IT question. I don't know that there is an actual metric. Um, I believe um, Ms. Obenstein is is working on those metrics at this time. Um, she actually was um, asking us what our uh, thoughts were on that process. So, Ms. Stevens, I can I can okay. uh, provide that um, uh, as an informal metric, uh, we do calibrate uh, from an IT standpoint as uh, 30 days open as a number that we want to uh, pay uh, attention to. Uh, but as far as a formal process, uh, that office within DOIT, I believe, is uh, continuing to work on those metrics. But uh, as an informal number, we do metric ourselves at 30 days uh, or older for tickets. OK, great, thank you. So then for those tickets, um, there was an August, I believe that's still issue eight, there was an August 2023 completion date. So those remaining, uh, what is it, 83 tickets, does that mean that they're all going to be closed, the ones that were identified between December 2021 and December 2022? Are those all going to be closed by August 2023? So my expectation is that they will be closed. Um, and as I said before, the issues have been resolved. It's the technical piece of going in and physically closing the ticket in the system. Um, that's the that's the, the 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 disconnection. That's the piece that Dr. Roberts and I don't actually know how to do because we we apparently missed that training when we when we received this responsibility. So the issues are resolved. The okay. actual closing of the ticket is what needs to happen okay. in the so system. It's just the logistics of closing mm -hmm. the tickets. Yes. So. Yeah. So okay. nobody's out there waiting to be supported. We what we do is call the people. We call whoever's on the ticket directly and solve the problem over the phone or through Teams. Uh, we just don't know how to go in and do the the last step. That's the piece that will be done by August because we'll we'll learn how to do it and get it done. Okay. Got it. Thank you. And then so relating to that software, that focus, um, it sounds like there are internal, I guess, adjustments that can be done by the BCPS IT. So I heard about the, the pull down and the drop down menus, and I was glad to hear that because that was some of my questions. But then also relating to that specifically, and again, I guess this is more IT, as those different um, Acronyms are called out. Dr. Roberts talked about, I think it was called SPTA. Am I saying that mm -hmm. right, Dr. Roberts? Okay. Yes. So after the um, enrollment liaison does that in a pull down menu, is there a way, again, in that same software to adjust it? So if they do um, SPTA and it's for employee, child of employee, that everything else after that option is only related to that. So like to give an example, like when we do pull down menus, um, if we're doing something and it says we pull the state of Maryland and the next thing is county, the only counties that show will be applicable to the state of Maryland. So I guess can, are we able to do something like that, some adjustment as well in the software? Um, just to, it almost kind of helps the the liaisons from making that those kinds of mistakes as well, because the computer is is directing them the right way. 
So, I think with, um, oh, I'm sorry. The, the purpose of the override address um, feature is so that we can enter a student into focus in a particular school. So uh, if a child is at us is receives a special permission transfer um, for program of study, let's say they live in the area of Dundalk, but they are going to um, Randallstown for the for the program. The only way they can be entered into the system into focus is that if we use an address override reason that lets us go to the next step of enrollment. So in the in the software, you enter the child's address. If the system picks up that that address does not belong to that school, it's not zoned for that school, then you have to you select one of those reasons to override the system so that you can go to the next step of enrollment. That's the okay. that's where that feature lies. It's, it's during when you put the address, the student's address in, the system will automatically say, okay, this, this is not the zone school for that address. Then you have to override it to get to move to the next to the next part of the enrollment process. Okay. All right, understood. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then last question. So the tax records, they have been kind of used, they haven't been incorporated yet into the superintendent's rule. Were there any other documents that were discovered during the process that probably also will end up being incorporated or should be considered for incorporation? Dr. Roberts. Yes, one of the issues that we found, especially during the pandemic, is the fact that people who are moving into the state or people who have moved recently Perhaps they save changing the address on their driver's license for last. It's not a priority at the time. And right now our rule says that the address on your driver's license has to match the address under which the student is being enrolled. And we found that to be a barrier because again, people don't always rush out to change their driver's license address. And so it was posing some problems. So as we revise 5150, we do want to offer some flexibility in that regard, because if a person is presenting their driver's license simply as identification, what difference does the address make? If I'm presenting my driver's license to say I'm Kevin Roberts, it does not matter what the driver's license address says, because we ask people also, we give them other forms of identification to use, that do not even have an address on it, and they can use that with no problem. But we were sort of penalizing people for using their driver's license simply because it had an address on it. And when the address didn't match, it really created a barrier to students being able to enroll right away. Okay, makes sense. Thank you. You're welcome. That's it. For Mr. Time. Young, any questions? No, I don't have any questions. Thank you. Ms. Barr, I just want to thank your, you and your group for this extensive you know, investigation. It looks like a lot, a lot of work went into it. So thank you very much. Thanks for everybody that cooperated and thanks for representing your department this evening and, and expressing ideas on how we can rectify this situation. Thank you very much. Item number five, new business. Ms. Barr, please proceed with the FY2427 Proposed Office of Internal Audit Work Plan. Ms. Barr. Yes, good afternoon and welcome to Ms. Frempong and to Mr. Young. Today we are seeking the committee's approval of the Office of Internal Audit FY24 to 27 work plan, as well as the approval to move it to the full board for its approval. In FY24, the Office of Internal Audit will have 15,000 285 available resource hours to complete this work plan. Our multi-year risk-based plan will allow us to focus our limited resources on audit activities that will provide recommendations to help mitigate identified risks, to enhance efficiency, effectiveness, reduce cost, and improve the quality of services delivered. A risk-based audit plan is fluid so that emerging risks and unplanned projects that require immediate attention can be addressed. Our office identified and prioritized potential audits and other projects using a risk-based approach by assessing various BCPS functions, examining information, conducting interviews of relevant personnel, 
and considering a variety of factors such as time of last audit, complexity of the department's program or activity, and the quality of internal control systems. We designed our work plan to address what we consider to be risk areas while limiting the scope of work that can be realistically accomplished within the available resource hours. So in FY24, we plan to accomplish several audit activities. We will continue to administer the fraud hotline and investigate any allegations related to fraud, waste, and abuse. We will complete the four prior year carryover projects as well as any carryover investigations. And at this time, we would have no idea how many investigations we would need to carry over. We will complete at least 24 risk-based audits that are noted on pages five and six of the plan. 14 of them right now are considered to be high risk projects, seven medium risk and three low risk. And just as well, we will complete general office responsibilities such as monitoring the budget, attending staff meetings, staff development activities, things of that nature. So as we finalize our audit plan, we keep in mind that new information may be brought to our attention or unanticipated events may occur that would cause the initiatives, priorities, and risks within BCPS to change. So the flexible nature of our audit plan as a living document provides the discretion to modify these projects when it is in the best interest of the board and BCPS. And we would like to extend our gratitude and appreciation to the board the audit committee, the superintendent and his cabinet, and BCPS management and staff for supporting our general mission of the office throughout the year. Before I conclude, I want to make sure that the committee members are aware that the audit committee meeting schedule is included on page 13 of the work plan and that your approval of the plan would also indicate approval of the meeting dates. I would now be happy to respond to committee member questions about our proposed work plan. Thank you. Committee members, any discussion on this item? Seeing none, we're going to move on. I will now entertain a motion for the committee to approve the Office of Internal Audit FY24-27 work plan and to move it to the board for its approval. So moved, Lichter. Ms. Lichter. Ms. Thank Barr, do I need a second on that? Are we going to vote on this? I believe you need a second, Mr. McMillian. OK. OK, Ms. Frempong seconded it. Is Ms. Jamison going to do the roll call vote here? Yes. Please. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Unanimous, thank so you. It passes unanimously and we'll move on to the board. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Mr. Fletcher, please proceed with the investigations update. Yes, sir, Mr. McMillian and Mr. Corns, thank you so much. I truly appreciate you. On the third page of this document, uh, Mr. Corns, where we're gonna start, uh, down one more. Yes, sir, right there. Uh, so thank you, Mr. McMillian. Uh, this is a report of our investigative stats for the month of April, 2023. And we'll start here uh, at table one. And so in April, we received nine cases and table one summarizes those cases, which show that four will be kept and investigated by the Office of Internal Audit. One was referred to BCPS management for investigation and four will be closed with a memo to file as the information provided was not in the purview of the hotline. And so for, for the four cases kept, uh, for investigation by internal audit. One has been classified as payroll fraud, two are classified as employee behavior, and the remaining one is a falsification of records. So as we move on to the next uh, table on the next page, Mr. Corns, thank you so much. <clears throat> we note that in addition to the nine new cases that were received during April, 14 cases were already open from the previous month. So there are 23 open cases during the entire month. Now, no cases were actually closed during the month, so all 23 remain open as of the end of April. Now, for the Office of Internal Audit Investigations, which is the, the first column there, 12 were open uh, as of the end of the month, and details for all those cases are available on Table 3, which is on the subsequent page. For management investigations, 
uh, which are here in the second column, five were open as of the end of the month. And detail for, details for all of those cases are available in table four, uh, which is actually on page five below. And then lastly, uh, for the cases that are outside the purview of the hotline, uh, there in the final column, six uh, were open as of the end of April. And details for those cases are available in table five, uh, which is down below on page six. And Mr. McMillian, I turn it back over to you for any questions. Okay, great. Committee members, any questions? Seeing no questions, Mr. Fletcher, thank you very much. Absolutely, thank you. Item number six, announcements. The next meeting of the Audit Committee will be on Tuesday, June 20th, 2023 at 4.30 p.m. Item number seven, administrative function. I will now entertain a motion to convene an administrative function session to discuss the operations of the committee and investigations conducted by the staff of the Office of Internal Audit that are required by the Audit Committee Chair Charter. A motion, please. So moved, Lichter. Ms. Lichter, we need a second. Second, Young. Mr. Young, second it. Ms. Jamison, would you conduct the vote for us, please? Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Frumpong? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Thank you. It is properly moved and seconded and 